Hello, happy believers. Welcome to my art gallery and to painting number 57. I will continue reading from the Catechism from Part 3, Section 1, Chapter 1, Articles 2 and 3. I will start with a prayer. O Holy Spirit, beloved of my soul, I adore you. Enlighten, guide, strengthen and console me. Tell me what I ought to do and command me to do it. I promise to submit to everything that you ask of me and to accept all that you allow to happen to me. Just show me what is your will. I hope you enjoyed the audio and if you enjoy visiting my art gallery, please like, subscribe and share. I will also leave a few personal thoughts on my painting in the description below. Article 2. Our vocation to Beatitude. The Beatitudes are at the heart of Jesus' preaching. They take up the promises made to the chosen people since Abraham. The Beatitudes fulfil the promises by ordering them no longer merely to the possession of a territory, but to the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. The Beatitudes depict the countenance of Jesus Christ and portray his charity. They express the vocation of the faithful associated with the glory of his passion and resurrection. They shed light on the actions and attitudes characteristic of the Christian life. They are the paradoxical promises that sustain hope in the midst of tribulations. They proclaim the blessings and rewards already secured. However, dimly, for Christ's disciples, they have begun in the lives of the Virgin Mary and all the saints. 2. The Desire for Happiness The Beatitudes respond to the natural desire for happiness. This desire is of divine origin. God has placed it in the heart of every human heart. God has placed it in the human heart in order to draw men to the one who alone can fulfil it. We all want to live happily. In the whole human race, there is no one who does not assent to this proposition, even before it is fully articulated. How is it, then, that I seek you, Lord, since, in seeking you, my God, I seek a happy life? Let me seek you so that my soul may live. For my body draws life from my soul, and my soul draws life from you. God alone satisfies. The Beatitudes reveal the goal of human existence, the ultimate end of human acts. God calls us to his own Beatitude. This vocation is addressed to each individual personally, but also to the Church as a whole. 
the new people make made up of those who have accepted the promise and live from it in faith. 3. Christian Beatitude The new Beatitude, the New Testament, uses several expressions to characterise the Beatitude to which God calls men. The coming of the kingdom of God. The vision of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Entering into the joy of the Lord. Entering into God's rest. There we shall rest and see. We shall see and love. We shall love and praise. Behold, what will be at the end without end? For what other end do we have if not to reach the kingdom which has no end? God put us in the world to know, to love and to serve him and so to come to paradise. Beatitude makes us partakers of the divine nature of eternal life. With beatitude, man enters into the glory of Christ and into the joy of the Trinitarian life. Such beatitude surpasses the understanding and powers of man. It comes from an entirely free gift of God, whence it is called supernatural as is the grace that disposes man to enter into the divine joy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It is true because of the greatness and inexpressible glory of God that men shall not see me and live, for the Father cannot be grasped. But because of God's love and goodness toward us and because he can do all things, he goes so far as to grant those who love him the privilege of seeing him. For what is impossible for men is possible for God. The beatitude we are promised confronts us with decisive moral choices. It invites us to purify our hearts of bad instincts and to seek the love of God above all else. It teaches us that true happiness is not found in riches or well-being, in human fame or power or in any human achievement, however beneficial it may be, such as science, technology and art, or indeed in any creature, but in God alone, the source of every good and of all love. All bow down before wealth. Wealth is that to which the multitude of men pay an instinctive homage. They measure happiness by wealth, and by wealth they measure respectability. It is a homage resulting from a profound faith that with wealth he may do all things. Wealth is one idol of the day, and notoriety is a second. Notoriety, or the making of a noise in the world, it may be called newspaper fame, has come to be considered a great good in itself and a ground for veneration. The Decalogue, the Sermon on the Mount and the Apostolic Catechesis describe for us the paths that lead to the Kingdom of Heaven. Sustained by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we tread them step by step, by everyday acts. By the working of the word of Christ, we slowly bear fruit 
in the church to the glory of God. In brief, the Beatitudes take up and fulfil God's promises from Abraham on by ordering them to the kingdom of heaven. They respond to the desire for happiness that God has placed in the human heart. The Beatitudes teach us the final end to which God calls us, the kingdom, the vision of God, participation in the divine nature and eternal life, filiation, rest in God. The beatitude of eternal life is a gratuitous gift of God. It is supernatural, as is the grace that leads us there. The Beatitudes confront us with decisive choices concerning earthly goods. They purify our hearts in order to teach us to love God above all things. The Beatitude of Heaven sets the standards for discernment in the use of earthly goods and in keeping with the law of God. Article 3. Men's Freedom God created man a rational being, conferring on him the dignity of a person who can initiate and control his own actions. God willed that men should be left in the hand of his own counsel, so that he might of his own accord seek his creator and freely attain his full and blessed perfection by cleaving to him. Man is rational and therefore like God. He is created with free will and is master over his acts. 1. Freedom and Responsibility Freedom is the power rooted in reason and will to act or not to act, to do this or that, and so to perform deliberate actions on one's, on one's own responsibility. By free will, one shapes one's own life. Human freedom is a force for growth and maturity in truth and goodness. It attains its perfection when directed toward God, our beatitude. As long as freedom has not bound itself definitively to its ultimate good, which is God, there is the possibility of choosing between good and evil. There is the possibility of choosing between good and evil and thus of growing in perfection or of failing and sinning. This freedom characterises properly human acts. It is the basis of praise or blame, merit or reproach. The more one does what is good, the freer one becomes. There is no true freedom except in the service of what is good and just. The choice to disobey and do evil is an abuse of freedom and leads to the slavery of sin. Freedom makes men responsible for his acts to the extent that they are voluntary. Progress is virtue, knowledge of the good and assesses enhance the mastery of the will over its acts. Impute ability and responsibility for an action can be diminished or even nullified by ignorance, inadvertence, duress, fear, habit, inordinate attachments and other psychological or social factors. Every act directly willed is imputable to its author. Thus the Lord asked Eve, 
after the sin in the garden. What is this that you have done? He asked Cain the same question. The prophet Nathan questioned David in the same way after he committed adultery with the wife of Uriah and had him murdered. An action can be indirectly voluntary when it results from negligence regarding something one should have known or done. For example, an accident arising from ignorance of traffic laws. An effort and effect can be tolerated without being willed by its agent. For instance, a mother's exhaustion from tending her sick child. A bad effect is not imputable if it was not willed either as an end or as a means of an action. E.g. a death a person incurs in aiding someone in danger. For a bad effect to be imputable, it must be foreseeable and the agent must have the possibility of avoiding it, as in the case of manslaughter caused by a drunken driver. Freedom is exercised in relationships between human beings. Every human person created in the image of God has the natural right to be recognised as a free and responsible being. All owe to each other this duty of respect. The right to exercise of freedom, especially in moral and religious matters, is an inalienable requirement of the dignity of the human person. This right must be recognised and protected by civil authority within the limits of the common good and public order. 2. Human freedom in the economy of salvation. Freedom and sin. Man's freedom is limited and fallible. In fact, man failed. He freely sinned. By refusing God's plan of love, he deceived himself and became a slave to sin. This first inhalation engendered a multiple, a multitude of others. From its outset, human history attests the wretchedness and oppression born of the human heart in consequence of the abuse of freedom. Threats to freedom. The exercise of freedom does not imply a right to say or do everything. It is false to maintain that man, the subject of this freedom, is an individual who is fully self-sufficient and who finality is the satisfaction of his own interests in the enjoyment of the earthly goods. Moreover, the economic, social, political and cultural conditions that are needed for a just exercise of freedom are too often disregarded or violated. Such situations of blindness and injustice injure the moral life and involve the strong as well as the weak in the temptation to sin against charity. By deviating from the moral law, man violates his own freedom, becomes imprisoned within himself, disrupts neighbourly fellowship and rebels against divine truth. Liberation and Satisfaction By his glorious cross, Christ has won salvation for all men. He redeemed them from the sin that held them in bondage. For freedom, Christ has set us free. In him, we have communion with the truth that makes us free. The Holy Spirit has been given to us and, as the Apostle teaches, where the Spirit of the Lord is, 
there is freedom. Already we glory in the liberty of the children of God. Freedom and grace. The grace of Christ is not in the slightest way a rival for our freedom. When this freedom accords with the sense of the true and the good that God has put in human hearts. On the contrary, as, as Christian experience attests especially in prayer, the more docile we are to the promptings of grace, the more we grow in inner freedom and confidence during trials, such as those we face in the pressures and constraints of the outer world. By the working of grace, the Holy Spirit educates us in spiritual freedom in order to make up free collaborators in his work in the church and in the world. By the working of grace, the Holy Spirit educates us in spiritual freedom in order to make us free collaborators in his work in the church and in the world. Almighty and merciful God, in your goodness, take away from us all that is harmful, so that, made ready both in mind and body, we may freely accomplish your will. In brief, God willed that man should be left in the hand of his own counsel, so that he might of his own accord seek his creator and freely attain his full and blessed perfection by cleaving to him. Freedom is the power to act or not to act, and so to perform deliberate acts of one's own. Freedom attains perfection in its acts when directed towards God, the sovereign God. Freedom characterises properly human acts. It makes the human being responsible for acts which he is the voluntary agent. His deliberate acts properly belong to him. The imputability or responsibility for an action can be diminished, can be diminished or nullified by ignorance, duress, fear and other psychological or social factors. The right to exercise of freedom, the right to the exercise of freedom, especially in religious and moral matters, is an inalienable requirement of the dignity of men. But the exercise of freedom does not entail the punitive right to say or do anything. For freedom Christ has set us free. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. That concludes my session for today. I hope you enjoyed listening and reflecting on my painting and I hope you find it as educational as I do. I will not be editing my audio, so apologies for mispronouncing some words. Some chapters are easier than others. Please like, subscribe and share so we can all live our wonderful Catholic faith in all its richness. I will now finish with a prayer. O angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever today be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen.